Hello there and welcome everybody to another episode of Rowing Chat. I'm Rebecca Caro, the host of the Rowing Chat Podcast Network, and today I'm joined by Greg Spooner. Welcome. Thank you very much. Very excited to be on here with you. So, Greg, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background in the sport of rowing. So I hail from Seattle, Washington, and uh, for the last four years, I've actually been down here in San Diego, California, uh, endless summer. And, you know, I didn't start rowing until my junior year in college. Uh, until that point, I was a multi-sport athlete, uh, wasting my time on basketball courts and baseball fields until I really found what was the, uh, uh, what would be my, my lifelong passion. Um, and, uh, you know, after really finding a love for rowing in college, uh, I tried to continue that pursuit post-collegiate, found out that at six foot three and 200 pounds, I was, didn't have what it would take to, uh, to make a national team of any type. Um, switched actually over, over to open water and ocean going rowing uh, for a time. And uh, with a, a nonprofit organization that I set up with my good friend, Jordan Hansen, we put together an ocean row and went from New York City to Falmouth, England, all the way across the North Atlantic Ocean. Against the current and the winds. With the uh, wind. With. The, the Atlantic Ocean, much like the Pacific, it travels in a big gyre, if you will. And so you have the Gulf Stream current that is coming up along the eastern seaboard uh, and then heads uh, east northeast out across the open ocean it's like imagine a a very defined river of warm water that is pushing its way uh eastward up toward england and the gulf stream is actually the reason why england at such a high latitude can maintain these somewhat uh temperate uh, and just wet winters instead of being an ice box like other countries at its latitude so um so it was a race that we were in and uh, which we won, by the way, by about a week and a half. You miss it. And, uh, and uh, it was beautiful is, is along the way, you had an opportunity to see sites that, of course, you're never going to see. Uh, different types of seabirds, dolphins playing with your boat and trying to play in your wake every single day. They get bored really fast because we're going very slow. And we saw sharks while we were out there. We saw whales that were running solo. We saw a, pilot, a pot of pilot whales, um, sunfish, tuna, uh, everything. It was you know, people who spend a lot of time on ships out in the open ocean, they say it's like a desert. Well, that's because they're way up high on the deck and the motors are, are very loud. But when you're actually there and you hear that quiet, boom, boom, 24 hours a day, it's, like, it's entrancing. For the, for the sea life to come and check you out and see what you're all about. And uh, along the way, we learned lessons about uh, why we should bring more food next time, how to be better teammates, uh, and also how to take care of our bodies along the way. That makes for great recipes for a fantastic book written by Jordan called Rowing Into the Sun uh, that I highly encourage. Um, and it's turned into other programs that we've done uh, in regard to rowing um, around Vancouver Island in Canada, across the Atlantic Ocean again from West Africa toward Miami, which ended up in a nice uh, capsize and an hour on Dateline NBC. Who survived? And, um, and then, but what, it's all, what it also did along the way is, is it allowed my professional passions to dovetail with my recreational passion. And, and that's where phys, uh, physical therapy or physio to everybody outside the US um, and rowing really had a chance to coalesce and, uh, and be my, my pursuit. Fantastic. And now you have a business called Row Physio, as it says on the t-shirt. So what's your approach to injury rehabilitation? Injury re rehabilitation always starts with getting to know the athlete more than getting to know the injury. So before I even see the person in the clinic or at the boathouse, we're going to take 20 to 30 minutes to chat about not only the injury itself, but maybe what led to the injury. We're going to talk about the training profile. We're going to talk about sleep, which is a, a critical component of injury prevention. We're going to talk about stretching and mobility. We'll talk about their nutrition. Uh, we'll talk about any other sorts of uh, do-it-yourself 
um, uh, strategies that they've employed or other people they've talked to to really try and take a, a holistic approach to uh, getting the athlete not only you know, if they're out of the boat, getting them back in the boat, or if they're in there and just trying to battle this this nagging injury uh, to allow them to 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 just become more durable and uh, stick around for longer with more success. And did you figure this out for yourself? Because I'm guessing you've been injured over the history of your athletic career. Yeah, you know, as, as a matter of fact, something very common to, uh, to people with low back pain, of which more than 80% of the entire world's population gets back pain. I've never met people from that 20%, by the way, whoever those 20% were that were steady. Um, so age of 19, I was home from college. I was playing a pickup basketball game and uh, I went in for a rebound, grabbed it, twisted my body. And next thing I knew, I had this sharp, uh, just electric shock going down my leg. Everything seized up in my back and I had to have somebody drive me home and I spent the next four, to, uh, four hours on the floor. And ever since then, uh, even as a physical therapist, I can count on the fact that one to two times a year, I'm gonna have back pain. I'm gonna start to feel my toes tingle a little bit. And you know, I, I think to somebody who maybe doesn't deal with this sort of um, injury or these sort of symptoms that often, that can be really scary. And you know, cause the, the lumbar spine and the back and the buttocks and sciatica, you can't see it. You just feel it. And I can't tell you how many people go to the ER really concerned that something nasty is about to happen. And I, I don't blame them, you know, because it takes information to really know what's going on. And, um, you know, so armed with the right information, armed with knowing that a disc bulge is extremely common and that over 60% of us, by the time we're 30, are going to have a disc bulge and we don't even know it. Um, and you know, knowing that that's normal, knowing that there's no such thing as a slipped disc, that's just a common phrase for, uh, for something that uh, physiologically can't happen. Um, and just being armed with, with the basic information, even before I became a physical therapist, it really helped to, to understand, engage how I would then treat myself. And then now as a PT, I, I really employ a lot of the same uh, strategies that I learned from uh, my physical therapist way back then. And so, you know, when I, when I see a lot of people with back pain, which is my most common uh, malady, uh, we start with the basics. What is a disc? Where is the nerve? Where is the spine? Know that the bark is always going to be worse than the bite. And, and we really take it from there to, uh, to try and, and allow each patient, each client, each athlete, the opportunity to feel like they're in charge again, that they can be the primary component to uh, seeing better results and living uh, closer, if not pain-free. That's a fantastic philosophy. So tell me a bit about which of the recurring injuries that you see regularly in your practice as a physio. Sure, well, you know, like I just touched on, uh, the low back has many different ways that it's going to hurt. And um, when you really get to the brass tacks of what's happening in the low back, the majority of the time, you can actually pinpoint it to something being disc related. You know, going back to what I was talking about, how the disc may bulge, but the discs don't slip. You know, you have contents within the disc itself that are going to be somewhat mobile. So, uh, so, so tell me this, Rebecca, what's your favorite color? Yellow. Yellow. Okay. And what is your favorite toothpaste or the one that you may be using right now? McLean's mint, not spearmint. Never. So imagine a yellow balloon full of McLean's mint toothpaste. Okay. And <clears throat> that is sandwiched in between your lumbar vertebrae. Okay. So it's sitting right there. Now, what do you think would happen? if I put a little bit of pressure on the front of that yellow balloon full of toothpaste, where would that toothpaste go? Toward the back. Toward the back, exactly. And then likewise, I go the other way, right back the other way we came. So you think of all the time that we spend sitting at our desks, which is a normal everyday part, sitting 
is not the new smoking. It's only the new smoking if you go from sitting at your desk to sitting on your, in your car to sitting on your couch, okay? Um, but sitting provides pressure on the front of the disc, much like rowing is going to do that because we are a, so a sport that sits down facing backward. And we put a lot of pressure on the front of that disc. And so there's going to be this consistent draw of the contents, that McLaren's toothpaste, okay, back toward the back side of that disc. And what lives back there is your spinal cord and your nerves that exit out toward, you know, basically what become your sciatic nerve. And so very often what I end up seeing is there's been uh, this collection, if you will, of these contents. They migrate within that yellow balloon full of toothpaste back to one side or the other, and it can get stuck there. And so the very first thing that we're gonna do when we do our first assessment when it comes to the low back is, is we need to get things sort of re reshifted and reorganized, okay? We need to figure out where's all that toothpaste and how can we get it shifted back to the center, okay? And as long as you know only one or two of the moves that you have to do to, 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 to make that happen, you've already managed I'd say about 75% of your back symptoms. And so um, that's what we do every single time somebody comes into me, whether they feel something in their, in their glutes, something traveling down their leg, whether it's heat or cold or tingling, whether there is SI joint pain or discomfort, whether they have some uh, tightening of the back muscles like a spasm, it all starts in the same place. And then kind of like, um, if you will, uh, when, we're, when we're getting uh, treatment started for the back, we build that foundation of good mobility and good disc content placement. And then from there, depending on what sport they're doing, what seat they're in, what time of the season they're in, we can then launch into whatever the best avenue is to then further their care. So what are those critical two movements patterns that you just described? Oh, it all depends. <laughs> That's the, the one answer you always get from a physical therapist, guaranteed. I'll, I'll tell you this. So generally, when somebody feels something into uh, their SI joint or into their glutes or into their legs, just about every time it's going to be to one side, okay? And so what that means is, is all that McLaren's toothpaste has pushed that yellow balloon back to one corner or back to the other corner. So, and what we tend to see then when I do a, a first postural assessment is see if I can step back a bit here is, I'm gonna exaggerate this, but we'll see a shift over to one side, okay? Because they're, they're, they're trying to take the pressure off of, uh, of that toothpaste, off of that uh, nerve. And so uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll get the person set up and actually, you know, imagine this, this balloon analogy here. I squeeze a little bit on one side, it's a little bit bigger on the other. And I'll slowly just start to, to give some gentle pulses on that balloon to get it to go back to center and get it to go even, okay? And we do that up against a wall or a poster or a column, and, uh, and it basically involves stabilizing the upper body and then shifting the hips back underneath, okay? And it's not forceful. You always want to work within your tolerance because otherwise your body's going to say, like, ouch, stop, and it'll seize up again. So you listen to your body, you work with it, and that's part one. And then part two is, uh, is something that I think all of us do without even realizing it that's beneficial. And that's where you put your hands on your hips, feet about hip width, keep your knees straight, and you gently start to hinge backward, okay? And multiple repetitions, again, not forcing it. Doing it until you feel like you're starting to loosen up again. And, uh, and what you'll find is, is that upon reassessment of that form, of that posture, everything is starting to get back into alignment again, okay? And then you can uh, cue in your, your neuromuscular system, your proprioceptive system to then understand and appreciate all of that work that you've just done to stabilize your spine and uh, make you uh, more durable when it's time to start rowing again. That's fantastic advice. And certainly, i sure I can practice those two exercises to loosen up my back. Now, what advice do you have to people who are coaches, who are working with a group of athletes who may be high schoolers or they may be masters? How can they be um, alert to injuries so that they're sending you someone who can be fixed easily. Because most athletes, most of us just go, fix me, fix me, get me back in the boat. So what do you tell coaches? 
Or on the other hand, some of the athletes are, they don't say a word because maybe there's a fear that they're gonna lose their spot in the boat or there's a big regatta coming. So the communication can really falter. I mean, case in point, I'm working with a local university here in San Diego and had an athlete who felt some oncoming uh, rib pain and thought, ah, it'll get better, it'll get fine. It started to build, but yet still, what, you know, that person still was not uh, maybe confident enough or assured enough that if it were brought up with the coach, that it wouldn't interrupt her season. Well, that just blew up. And now that athlete is out six weeks. So, you know, the, 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 the first thing that I try to stress with the coaches is to, uh, to really stress that communication about how you're feeling, what the aches and pains are, uh, it's all very normal, okay? And, uh, and that just because you may hurt or something may feel a little bit nagging in pain, it doesn't mean that your moments from self-destruction, but it does mean that, that, that that's your, a cue for your body to say, hey, something is up right now, okay? Something's been going on under the surface long enough where finally your body said, I've had it. And then you start to see those symptoms. And um, sometimes it's a little too late once that finally happens. You know, as I know, uh, uh, lots of other um, medical specialists uh, and trainers talk about. Um, but oftentimes, too, if you can catch something early enough, you can uh, mitigate uh, just how nasty those results are. So that's first and foremost, I think, the first thing that I, I would have a coach um, do is, is establish that good communication and, and solid understanding of, of how um, injury and symptoms play into uh, an athlete's uh, really career. I remember my first year on a, a university team and the coach Nick saying to us, right, just I want you all to understand that we take injuries seriously here. And so, you know, we need to treat them early. And I had absolutely no understanding of what that meant. What was an injury? What, what does early treatment mean? And I did know that there was a medical center that I could go to that, you know, supported um, athletes in the university. But I didn't, he didn't clarify and say, this means that you have a sore muscle, you know, something hurts that you think shouldn't hurt. This means that. And, you know, I was just young and ignorant, but I think that that, that going back to basics and reiterating what you mean by, you know, communication, this means that you must tell me in an email or a text or whatever. And what you're seeing across the, across the spectrum here with um, rowing programs around at least the United States, I uh, haven't spoken with many outside of the U.S., is... Um, you're getting about as close to uh, uh, having an embedded physio um, as you could be uh, to, so that way you can have somebody tracking or following from the movement systems perspective as to what, it, what is the baseline of this athlete at the beginning of the season and then checking in periodically as needed. So that way you can know and really understand um, and hopefully catch something early before it gets worse. Um, and, uh, and then so, so they can just jump right to it, whether get into a trainer and do these activities, get into a physio and get involved with these musculoskeletal changes or neuromuscular changes that need to happen, or maybe they need to get sent out to a sports medicine physician for a brief time. You know, there, there are many options. And, and so it helps to, to be able to just have data that, uh, that can be drawn from. And so, and actually, one of those pieces of data that, you know, this is kind of going back to, to coaches and the type of advice that would be helpful for them is knowing what else that they can look for, knowing what else they can talk about from the perspective of athlete performance. You know, early on, we talked about sleep as being extremely effective from the standpoint of injury prevention and, you know, like almost like a performance enhancing drug, if you will. Um, and if you have somebody who's not getting their eight hours, they quite literally are, are 1.7 times as likely as their counterparts to uh, incur an injury. And so how can you get coaches um, under, you know, understanding at the very least just the basics of ensuring that their athletes are well rested, that they have good recovery opportunities, and that includes nutrition, so that could be another specialty or some more education that, that could be sought after. Um, 
and just more information, more data that can be useful for, uh, for the holistic treatment team. So when you talk about having an embedded physio with the crew, does that uh, job start with a movement assessment of each athlete individually? Uh, it, it depends on the crew. It depends on the time that you have uh, allotted for each. And it depends on the coach and how much they really want to work with you. Because you know, a lot of times this is something new. And, and the coach says, look, this is what I've been doing for 20 years. I have this program. It's worked this well. Uh, yeah, some people get injured. But, you know, but we're, we're, we're succeeding. And, and you don't try and change everything overnight. So, so you have to, to see what that coach feels like his or her needs really are and then start from there. So personally, I'd love to do a movement assessment. Make sure that the spine, the pelvis, and the hips in particular are moving as they should be and that there aren't any substantial restrictions there. Uh, next, we'll look up at the shoulders and your thoracic spine or mid to upper back. So that way we could try to avoid some of those other no fun injuries like any sort of shoulder impingement uh, or other type of injury or, or uh, especially in the female more than the male population, uh, a rib stress injury. Fascinating stuff. Now I'm just going to take a short break here to tell you about Rowing Tales. So this was a book that I published with Peter Mallory a year ago. It's an anthology, a collection of stories about rowing. And we've just done a second edition for 2018. And I do not have a copy to show you because it's on its way from the printers. It's called Rowing Tales 2018. It has a glorious front cover designed by Annabelle Ayres, who is an Olympian and a wonderful rowing artist. And Peter has again found an amazing collection of people to tell us their rowing stories. We've published a couple of them already on the Row Perfect blog, and you will find Rowing Tales on Amazon, on Kindle, and on the Row Perfect store. My second announcement is about Christmas. Golly, it's coming up fast. And if you need to buy gifts with a rowing theme for your friends and relations, there's a web page where a lot of rowing companies have publicized what they have to sell. The page is rowperfect.co.uk forward slash Christmas hyphen gifts. And on there, you'll find a whole heap of things from magazine subscriptions to colored hairbands to clothing to rigging tools, pretty much the whole gamut of stuff, something suitable for nearly everybody in your life. So that's rowperfect.co.uk forward slash Christmas hyphen gifts. Now back to Greg Spooner. Greg, we know that a lot of people who listen to this podcast are masters athletes and they train without a coach a lot of the time. And of course, our discussion thus far has been very focused on advice for coaches and what to do within the confines of an organized program. Do you have any guidance for these sorts of athletes who haven't got someone in the coach boat taking a look at them all the time? With, with the internet and all of the resources that are available, there are so many different places that you can find the two moves you have to do to solve one problem. The three stretches that are unbeatable when it comes to getting rid of neck pain. Uh, you know, everybody's different, right? Uh, and, and, but then again, we are, especially when, if we don't have a coach, if we don't have somebody right there on site who can help us, we are in need for, for information that we can use to try and, uh, and find ways to limber up, to feel healthier, to feel like we can gain speed, uh, gain comfort, you know? And so, uh, there are certainly uh, some, some people and places out there who put out fantastic content uh, online. I mean, uh, I do myself through rowphysio.com and at my YouTube uh, page. And so I, I certainly encourage people to, to go there and uh, have a few videos uh, that are in the process of filming and editing, uh, actually talking a bit about how to self-treat back pain. Okay, 
and where to start. So it incorporates some of what you and I already talked about earlier. Because like I said, a lot of this can be done by yourself if you know what to look for. Um, there is some great information on the strength training side of things, which uh, is a topic that um, cannot be stressed enough when uh, you're talking about masters rowers. Um, really rowing in general, but certainly in, in the masters category. Trying to make time for, for strength is, uh, is very important. And one of the, the places I go is actually somebody I believe uh, who uh, you spent some time chatting with uh, is Will Roof. Um, so he actually put together a great uh, um, collection or review of research studies looking at the common causes of uh, low back pain and wrist stress injuries uh, as it pertains to rowing specifically. Um, that's a great read. It can be a little dense if you're not uh, in, in the science field or in the health field, but uh, it's certainly worth perusing. Uh, but he also as well has some fantastic programs uh, that can be uh, put to use, even with just nominal uh, amounts of equipment. Um, finding access to uh, a local is best uh, physical therapist or a, a movement specialist, so physical therapist, chiropractor, etc. cetera, um, I think is a wonderful way for somebody to make a small investment in their health and in their speed uh, to help get better and get faster. And anywhere from one visit to three or four visits, I think one of uh, you know, any of the, the listeners or viewers, viewers here can have tremendous gains. You know, and I say specifically somebody who knows rowing because I've had somebody come to me remotely from Colorado and say, uh, Greg, I have pain, or sorry, I have uh, numbness into my hand when I reach overhead. I can't carry my baby in one hand. When I row on the starboard side, uh, I feel very weak and my muscles tighten up. And she went through physical therapy for about two months and had so, you know, fairly generic treatments that for those symptoms would work. But there was something about rowing in particular that didn't really allow those, that treatment to catch. And so we had uh, a chat over the phone, we exchanged a couple emails and hearing what she needed within a matter of a few weeks and a couple emails and uh, never having met her in person, we were able to completely solve her symptoms. Uh, and if you see video, which I think actually I actually have posted on uh, my website or on the YouTube page, uh, there's some great before and after of her rowing uh, before we did some, some work that way. And, uh, and she just had a, a fantastic major turnaround. And so that's the kind of thing that many, many athletes, many rowing athletes would benefit from looking around for if they don't have anybody right on site. And what was the big insight that you brought to her treatment? Uh, well, it comes back to the hips and the pelvis, making sure that you're setting a really good foundation for sitting up, sternum up, okay? And also trying to make sure that we don't create this big C curve of an upper body as you're rounding to get up toward the catch. And then as you go through the drive, coming in and maintaining that C curve, you're always closing down the chest, especially the brachial plexus, where you have bundles of nerves that um, are traveling right through sets of muscles. And if there's a pinch there for any reason, then you're gonna to start to feel symptoms down here, whether it's a, a loss of sensation or some, uh, or some weakness. And so it, it's, it's about trying to bring, bring balance back to the body. So everybody has muscles that work with each other and the muscles that uh, oppose. And so when we're talking about finding balance, we know that there are gonna be some muscles on the front that love to draw those shoulders down and forward, okay? Especially if we're doing this all day, right? I'm guilty of it too. No, me. <laughs> yeah. And then we have muscles whose job it is, is to flatten those shoulder blades back down, okay? And then as we incorporate the forward and backward lean of, uh, of the stroke or any bit of the rotation that happens with the stroke, um, how can we complement what those muscles are doing to, to keep the, the strain off of those nerves and allow them to work um, at full speed? It basically, you know, think of it like when you're, uh, if you're out washing your car and, uh, or, wa or watering your, lawn, your, uh, your, your plants and the hose kinks up. I mean, that, that's basically what's happening with your nerves. And so you got to unkink the hose to get the flow. Sounds so easy when you say it like that. And I definitely endorse your recommendation to go see a movement therapist. I, I go and I call it a sort of general well-being, straighten me out. And sometimes I need it once a year. Sometimes I need it more frequently. But it's, I have happened to have had that visit three weeks ago. 
very beneficial. Good for you. Yeah. Let's roll back to sleep. I love what you said about sleep being the legal drug. What should we do in terms of checking out for ourselves what our current sleep patterns are and whether or not they might need changing? Sleep is one of those legal drugs, like you say, legal performance enhancers, that to be really effective, if you're gonna make a change, it's about having the honest assessment about yourself and your current habits. Much in the same way, if you're trying to get, get a, uh, if you're trying to have a solid understanding of your your daily intake, um, you know there, there's the app that I believe you and uh, Andy Franklin Miller talked about on the last podcast, uh, My Fitness Pal, uh, where you can you can track. You know when you actually put all that down on you know in front of you, say here's what I'm eating, here's my caloric intake, you know versus my output. There's a fantastic sense there. It's it's mind blowing to be able to understand just what you need to do to make those changes in the kitchen. So in regard to sleep, it's much the same thing. And you can use apps or you can use a piece of paper. Uh, I would definitely you know, encourage writing it down so you can see it and assess it and analyze it. And, and know when do you get in bed? When are you actually turning off the light or closing your book or turning off your phone? Uh, is the TV on in there? Okay, what are you watching? What are you thinking about? Um, what time are you getting up in the morning? What were your hydration uh, uh, habits like leading up to bedtime? How often are you having to get up at night? And so it's really trying to, to understand you in the present state with your sleep. And then only at that point can you start to make those, those real and profound changes. You know, so we were talking about the amount of hours that you need to be able to get. And you know, people have kids, they have crazy work hours, and, and it's understandable that you know, getting eight hours is just really hard for some. And it's also understandable, too, that, that some folks say, well, I thrive on five. And everybody's different, and, and I understand that. And, and you're trying to balance that with the physiologic process of the fact that sleep is when our heart rate drops, our blood pressure drops, the size of our brain actually shrinks, and we have this almost like the sewage system or scrubbers that are going through there and getting all these plaques that have formed, which are naturally occurring with everyday just use, use of our brain. It's like the exhaust of our brain, right? And it cleans all of that out. And so the better the sleep, the more the sleep, you clean all of that out. And what they find is there is a significant percentage drop in the uh, possibility of having dementia later on. So this, this, this makes for some long, really heady long-term stuff, you know? Um, and, uh, and so once you understand where you're at, you can start to make those incremental changes. So maybe first thing you do if you like to cruise social media at night or read um, a book on an electric device, a tablet or something, trying to get the, the, the nighttime mode so it drops the blue light and it makes it kind of an amber colored screen. That's, that is, uh, you know, your, your eyes are still stimulated, your brain is still stimulated, but it's not hitting that part of the brain stem that says, ah, morning, time to wake up, okay? And then, uh, and then so can you transition maybe to real books or can you give yourself a, a firm cutoff time? And so, so little changes like that, and I talk about hydration, making sure that you're not drinking anything within about an hour and a half of going to bed, so that way you're less likely to have to get up and pee in the middle of the night because I mean, nobody ever wants to get up and do it. You try and fend it off, and then when you finally go, you're like, oh, thank God, right? Well, in the first place, if you didn't have to do it, that would be great. So, um, and, you know, and there, there are other changes that can be made to your schedule as well. For example, uh, a university that I was working uh, with briefly um, up in the Pacific Northwest, uh, I had asked them about their sleep schedule, and actually ahead of time, based on that, some of this great research, they actually took their varsity practices to the afternoon, which is traditionally, uh, where do you find that, right? Um, and actually what ended up happening was, is the, uh, the kids got sick less often, the, um, their injury rates went down, and they were all happier. 
So, you know, it's, they're balancing school, they're balancing the perspective of graduation, they're balancing the social lives, and they're balancing just trying to move into adulthood. And that's a lot going on, and a lot of stuff going on up here that, that needs the opportunity just to hit reset. And so that was a big move that the, that the crew program made to find that success. Yeah, I certainly know there are programs that choose to train in the afternoon and others that don't. For myself, I occasionally have to do a late work call and I have one that regularly finishes well after 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I find it incredibly difficult to wind down after that and go to sleep. I can go straight to bed, but my brain doesn't turn off. Do you have any advice for that? You know, when we were getting ready to row across the Atlantic Ocean, it, those, those days were, you know, up by five, in bed by two, just long days. We were, we were totally going it alone. And so you have so much going on, and, and it was time to get in bed, so you knew you needed sleep, and your mind was racing. And, uh, and so I, I tried all the different uh, strategies myself of, <laughs> quite literally, counting sheep, jumping over fences. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, also what I did is I, I kept, um, this is very analog, I kept a notepad and I kept a pencil next to my bed and I wrote down all the stuff that was going on in my head that I wanted to make sure I did. And just about every time, there I went. So it works for me. I hope it works for other people. And I'd also encourage uh, your viewers to offer their recommendations uh, to see what they use. Because I'm, I'm sure somebody out there has the, the trick for somebody else. That's great. Now. On your website, you've also got a little shop, and I had a quick browse through it before we got online. What's your top recommendation of gear that people can use to um, keep themselves physiologically in the best possible shape? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Gear is important, and you don't need a lot of stuff to be successful. And so the gear that I sell, through Rogue Physio and RoguePhysioShop.com is gear that people can actually bring with them wherever they go. So for example, uh, foam rolling is, is a, a critical part of the treatment strategies that I use with people, whether we're working on calf muscles and better to get better ankle mobility, uh, hip mobility, back mobility, especially up at the top. And a foam roller is an exquisitely awkward piece of equipment to travel with. And so what I did is I actually, I actually tracked down this foam roller right here where it slides right into your bag, takes up no room. You pull the strings and you have a foam roller. And when Very you're done, hold it up, put it away. And then so it goes flat and then you can make it spherical when you need it. When you need it, yeah. And it's, it's extremely durable as well. Uh, the the People who made it—it was made actually—it was uh, uh, conceptualized by a former NFL uh, player up in Santa Barbara, who had to retire because of his back issues. But he lived and died by his roller, and he wanted to make one that would support him. And things support 350 pounds, so I'll take it. Yeah. He's a big fellow. Yeah. That's fabulous advice. And so, any last things that uh, we should have talked about, but I forgot to ask you. Well. You know, I think from the perspective of what to do when you're, you're either when you're injured or if you're just seeking information is when you're on the lookout for that information, when you're actually talking to somebody, uh, the more you can understand and comprehend what's going on, the more you can conceptualize it in your head, no matter what your background is, the better you're going to be able to implement the advice that's being given. So, you know, your yellow balloon full of McLaren's mint toothpaste. You can visualize exactly what's going on there when we talk about squeezing one side and having contents go the other, right? You know, and, and so sometimes it really helps to be able to simplify otherwise difficult or challenging or mysterious um, aspects of training or injuries to, to make it make more sense and to empower each athlete to be able to take control and feel like they're not um, being overtaken by the injury itself. So anytime somebody is, is interacting with a professional, if you have the opportunity to ask and say, wait, 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 wait. Can you explain that another way? Please do, because that's why they're there. And if you don't, 
you're going to get home or you're going to finish your, your video chat and you're going to have all these notes and you're going to come back to it the next day and think, oh gosh, what was this part? So I, I think that first and foremost is just asking as many questions as possible so that way you can, you can understand. Um, second is you know, I send out a lot of information myself to, uh, to people through my website, through rowphysio.com. So at the website, up in the right-hand corner, there's a big yellow button that people can press, and it'll give them an opportunity to put in their name and their email address, and what you'll get in return as thanks for that, and uh, um, as a little primer, if you will, is uh, I have a document on there that gets, uh, the, uh, gets the reader started on how to best think about and conceptualize what's going on as it pertains to sleep, as it pertains to mobility, and as, as it pertains to performance. So, and I have some links uh, on the, uh, within that PDF that they can take as well. Um, and one of the, uh, I, think, I think one of the, the aspects that they will appreciate the most in that document is there's a link to an eight minute long warm up that I wrote specifically for rowing that I even use myself before I go out. And if I don't have a lot of time for a warm up, I make time. I make these eight minutes to open up my hips, loosen up the hips and the pelvis and the hamstrings and get everything ready to go. So the moment I sit in the boat, I'm ready to go and I don't have to warm up a second time. So they're welcome to interact with that. That's fantastic advice and thank you very much. Now you also mentioned that you do remote consultations. How do they work? Uh, remote consultations work uh, much like this video chat is working here right now. So uh, through the website, there is a link under the services tab where you can contact me uh, for that free 20 minute consultation and we can you can schedule a time right there uh, or my contact information is at the bottom of the site and you can email or text me directly and so what we would do is we'd start out with a couple emails and uh, exchange some uh, you know and, and I'd ask for specific photos especially rowing so we can get a good sense as to what we need to help alleviate and the conversation will go from there and so what I anticipate, though, is that uh, with after the video chat and then a few email follow-ups, that um, that particular athlete should be feeling better, moving better, and, and uh, happy with their progress. Brilliant. Greg, it's been a delight. Thank you for your generosity, sharing your insights, your learnings, and also being really clear about my yellow balloon filled with toothpaste. Why is it toothpaste? Is that because it's an abrasive substance? <laughs> Yeah. Got it. Got yeah. it. Not, not liquid. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And you remember it too. It's, yeah. visual, it, it's right in there. I, I'll never forget. I now, tell, tell the listeners where they can get a hold of you online. Online it. available at rowphysio.com. And uh, all my contact information is on there. I'm also, I also have a uh, Facebook and an Instagram uh, page at Rofizio. Fantastic. Greg, it's been a delight talking to you. Thank you very much. And to our listeners, until next time, goodbye. <laughs>